Prologue, Unterribly in Massachusetts. Since it is no secret that wars and revolutions seldom settle anything, the founding fathers of the Republic should have been less startled than they were when shortly after the close of the American Revolution in Massachusetts, the Minutemen marched again. It happened in 1786. For the second time in a decade, the conch shell sounded on the village greens and the Minutemen marched. They were not only animated by the same spirit that impelled them on the road to Lexington, but many of them were the same men. They were supported by much of the old revolutionary paraphernalia, county conventions, committees of correspondence, resolutions solemnly taken. But this time they marched without the blessing of Boston, which in their eyes had replaced Britain as the enemy, and they did not have the old leadership. Those men who a short time ago had assured them that such conduct was logical, virtuous, and nobly patriotic now looked on aghast. George Washington wrung his hands and faced the fact that his dream of retiring to the placid obscurity of a country gentleman was premature. Unfinished business demanded his attention. Sam Adams, who so recently had been at such pains to rouse them to a proper revolutionary pitch, looked on with something of the affront of an impresario who sees his epic production plagiarized by amateurs and received by the gross masses with even more enthusiasm than the original had been. Of all the leaders of the earlier revolution, only Thomas Jefferson expressed anything like approval. A little rebellion now and then, he remarked, is a good thing for the Republic. But Jefferson, being in Paris, was at too far a remove to influence the course of events. The rebels never even heard that he was for them. Those of the founding fathers who were closer to the event, particularly the authorities in Massachusetts, believed that a government which must be sparked by a series of rebellions little or otherwise, is no better than anarchy. Accordingly, they set out to suppress this one. In their fright, they were perhaps not entirely intelligent about it. Careful scrutiny of the conduct of our illustrious forefathers sometimes give grounds for suspicion that they were not always much brighter than we are. Thanks largely to a certain obtuseness in their outlook, what at first could be dismissed as mere commotions presently had to be recognized as a rebellion. And finally, the harassed Commonwealth of Massachusetts declared itself in a state of war. It wasn't a long war. The rebels, as confused, as divided in their thinking as their political betters, ill-equipped and clumsily led, endowed by no ideology more fanatic than they, were, than they found in the scripture, and in Mr. Jefferson's declaration, were in no position to defeat Boston. Nor was it a bloody war. A latter-day Massachusetts slaughters more on its roads on a fine weekend than did the armies of Captain Daniel Shays and General Benjamin Lincoln in all the battlegrounds of a winter's campaign. The rebels themselves carried their muskets for months without firing a shot. Never were so many village Hamdens so guiltless of their country's blood. Nor could the government be called murderous. True, the cry of murder was raised against it when in a crisis it cut loose with its howitzers. But once it got the upper hand, it was singularly indisposed to demonstrate the majesty of the law on the gibbet. Only two rebels ever did hang to their vast and touching bewilderment and this for special cause not directly connected with the rebellion. A rebellion that results in few killings, no hangings, except for the hapless pair who were not rebels only, offers little to the injustice collectors of the major ideologies. For all that what came to be called Shays' Rebellion did bear some resemblance to a class war. Even to construct high tragedy from the episode requires the medium of fiction rather than of history. The rebels were simple people, little given to put, putting their private griefs on paper, and even if 
they had done so, not the sort whose papers get preserved from generation to generation and presently handed over to the historical societies. It is as hard to get at their intimate histories as if they were not men of good Puritan stock, but so many wild Indians. Like most Indians, their history is recorded by their enemies. Luckily, the latter were compassionate, compassionate more often than not, and sometimes perceptive. Even so, it would be hard to make an Orestes or an Oedipus of the rebel most thoroughly put on record, Captain Shays. But the little rebellion had consequences. No event which calls a Washington back to public life sets the best minds of the nation to re-examining their political philosophy and impels 13 governments of violently divergent interest into adopting a more perfect union can be dismissed without effect. Not that the Constitution of the United States was an aim of the rebels. On the contrary, they did their best to head it off. It became, however, one of their involuntary achievements. The Western world today is in a condition not unlike that of America in the years immediately following the revolution. The scale is immensely larger, the conflicts tragically intensified, the ideology set on a more rigid pattern, yet an analogy is there. We too suffer blank misgivings of a creature work, moving in worlds not realized. We too, owing immediate allegiance to, allegiance to governments of divergent interest, are fumbling our way to a notion of a larger entity above and beyond them, to the concept of a natural law under which all men can rationally govern themselves. We are still beset with the problem of how to make democracy work, and in our insecurities are still tempted to ascribe all troubles to our enemies instead of finding the cause of some of them in our own imperfections. <laughs>